Hello viewers, welcome to this episode of Healthy India. In recent episodes you have seen, we've talked about different organs of the body. We discussed problems of the heart, we discussed problems related to fatty liver, and today we touch upon a completely new but exceedingly important area for, for our health. And that is the area of kidneys. We all know that kidneys are very important organs in our body. There are two kidneys in our body which are situated in the abdomen. They are about the size of our fist uh, and they are shaped like beans. Like Rajma ki bean hoti hai, vaise hi kidney ki shape hoti hai. Or we often think of kidney disorders as something esoteric, something rare and you know not affecting uh, large segments of population. But more and more data has suggested that kidney disorders can affect a very large proportion of our population, including in India or maybe especially in India. Uh, the kidneys, as we know, are the filters uh, for our body. So they, they take out all the stuff that is not good for us, the toxins and other things, and they throw that out in the urine and keep our bodies healthy, our circulating blood healthy, so that we can carry on with our day-to-day -day activities and have a healthy life. But kidneys also have other roles. They, they produce hormones. They, they uh, are really important for calcium metabolism. And as we go along, we'll discuss aspects of kidney and kidney disease in India in particular. Uh, and uh, to help you with this today, we have three learned experts. You can't get a better team than this. Uh, we have uh, Professor Vijay Kher uh, to my right. Professor Kher is the chairman of uh, the Medanta Kidney and Transplant Institute. Uh, vast experience in, in nephrology, teacher of so many of us, uh, so many uh, nephrologists across the country. Uh, and uh, we are very happy to have you here, Dr. Kher. Uh, we have Dr. Dinesh Kuller, uh, eminent nephrologist and who heads the MAX division, the MAX Institute of Nephrology and Renal Transplant Medicine. And uh, we are really happy to have you here, Dr. Kuller, again. And I think this is exceedingly uh, fortunate for the viewers that we have got such a great team. And last but not at all the least is, is Dr. Sandeep Mahajan, who is a professor of nephrology at the very prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences, where many of us in that and in allied institutes have trained in our younger days. Uh, and as we know, these institutes, they provide us the manpower for running this, uh, the specialty services of this country. So with this kind of team in place, we will start very broadly uh, and uh, with, with a very sort of basic distinction, Dr. Kher, how do you distinguish, you know, people think of kidney disease, people don't understand. Uh, there is something called acute kidney disease or acute kidney failure, and then there is a chronic disease. So what is the story and how are they different? Well, I think uh, acute, as the name suggests, is an abrupt deterioration in kidney function, which occurs over hours to days. Whereas chronic is an irreversible process of slow deterioration of kidney function over months to years. And it takes many months to years for it to reach a stage when person requires a kidney transplantation or dialysis. So acute kidney disease or injury as it is called now is a reversible, potentially reversible process. Although if this disease progresses very uh, fast as well as there is rapid deterioration and multiple such episodes occur in such patients, this can also lead to chronic kidney disease over a period of months to years later on. That's why patients with acute kidney injury also need to be followed up even though they may have recovered their kidney function totally. So that's the so, so basic, basic difference. difference. And what typically causes, we'll focus in this discussion yeah. on chronic, but before that, what typically causes acute injury? What yeah, are acute, acute, injury? acute kidney injury occurs predominantly as a result of loss of volume in the blood, like gastroenteritis, nausea, dehydration, vomiting, dehydration volume depletion, uh, loss of blood suddenly as an accident you get, or sudden drop in blood pressure, which occurs also probably result of the dehydration in the volume because of the loss of volume. But it may occur also in patients with heart attack. Suddenly the heart function goes down and the kidney perfusion goes down. Or certain diseases which can affect the circulation of the kidney. The suddenly there is a drop 
in the circulation of the kidney. But these are potentially reversible. If you take care of the patients in this acute stage, which can be sometimes life-threatening at that stage, but if taken care of, then they should be able to recover their kidney function in almost most of the patients. So, so acute kidney injury, by definition, is typically reversible. But of course, the caveat is that the patient has to get appropriate attention and treatment at the right time. And if not, then it can actually be very dangerous uh, with, and patient may actually succumb to it if not attended to in time. But the, the truth is that uh, what is really spread in India in a way or increased in India in a way is the chronic kidney disease. And that is something that we are talking about more and more now. So why do you think, uh, Dr. Kuller, why uh, is chronic kidney disease, I mean, what are the causes of chronic kidney disease firstly? So that's very important to know and today uh, we are talking more and more about chronic kidney disease when we say that a given person has some kind of kidney disease. So in common parlance, it's that irreversible damage to the kidney which becomes very important to understand and as you have rightly pointed out, there are obviously many causes to it. In India, unfortunately, we have become the diabetes capital of the world. And diabetes is one of the most important causes which affect the kidneys as well. Almost 30 to 70 percent of diabetics are going to have some kind of kidney disease if they do not take good control of their diabetes. Diabetes which is preventable and look at the magnitude of the problem. We believe that roughly about maybe 8 crores uh, in India um, have diabetes. And if I were to say a reasonable figure of 40% getting affected by uh, diabetes, uh, their, their kidneys getting affected by diabetes, we are looking at over 3 crore of Indian population who will unfortunately have some kind of kidney problem related to diabetes. So one is diabetes, yes. that's a major cause. The second cause. is high blood pressure, hypertension, blood pressure. another lifestyle, a lifestyle disease which is preventable. And there are few conditions over which we may not have direct control, but then, yes, uh, our, our uh, habits, our uh, lifestyle, again, has a large role to play. We are talking about few glomerular diseases, whereby the filters, the, the filtering units of the kidneys get affected, and they lead on to something called chronic glomerulonephritis. We also have the interstitium, another component of the kidneys, which gets affected, and there the ingestion of large amount of painkillers, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, can have a role to play. Uh, obesity has a role to play in the causation of kidney disease, and again, a preventable lifestyle disease. Our habits, uh, tobacco chewing, uh, smoking, um, is, is one of the, the big killers and affects any vessels of the disease of the body, including the kidneys. And then we have some hereditary disorders. Unfortunately, we may not have direct control over that, but that also becomes a, a very important cause of uh, chronic kidney disease. And mind you, the factors which I am enumerating are the ones which cause a permanent and irreversible and more importantly, a progressive damage to the kidney. And if not taken care of at the right time, will eventually lead to a stage where one will have to rely on either dialysis or kidney transplantation. Another important thing which we have recently realized, and that's peculiar to uh, this part of the world, is something called chronic kidney disease of undiagnosed uh, or uncertain etiology. And we, we found that many of our laborers working out there in the scorching heat, hardly having an access to proper water and sanitation, they may be predisposed to something called CKDU. And we have to keep all these factors in mind because it takes, as Professor Kheers uh, pointed out, many years uh, before they manifest, and we have to catch them young. And so, so the important uh, messages here, uh, really significant points being made. And, you know, as we've spoken in detail in this program about the increase in diabetes in India and very high prevalence of diabetes, uh, as I, I will repeat again, that at the age of 40, the prevalence of diabetes in a metro like Delhi or Chennai would be close to 20%. And the age of 60, 
it almost touches 40%, 35 to 40%. So, so diabetes is really common and diabetes can lead to chronic kidney disease, one of the important causes, but well-controlled diabetes will not lead to anything. And that's very, very important. We sometimes forget that. We think, abhi diabetes ho gai, ab to kidney mari kabhi na kabhi chali jayegi. When patients come with the first diagnosis, they say that. But actually, agar aap shuru se apni sugar ko control rakhenge, to aapke gurde, aapki kidney bachi rahegi, aur koi complication nahi hoga. And the same is true for high blood pressure. High blood pressure, agar humne thik se treat kiya, uske bhi koi symptom nahi hoate. Diabetes ki bhi koi symptom nahi hoate. To agar hum usko shuru se thik se treat karenge, to humari kidney bachi rahegi. Agar hume diabetes hai, blood pressure hai, to we have to make sure that we control it from day one and we can, these are preventable complications. And obviously, as Dr. Kuller said, you have to give up smoking. I don't think there's any rocket science in that. Everyone knows that smoking harms every part of the body and kidney is, is, is no exception there. Uh, I'd like a little bit more uh, on, on the burden of disease uh, from you, uh, Dr. Mahajan. You know, like, is it, uh, we already spoke of some numbers, extrapolated numbers, which are striking, you know, because of diabetes being so common, hypertension being so common. What is the actual burden of disease as assessed in India? And, and you know, uh, is there, is there a change in profile? What, what has really happened? Well, uh, let us put it conservatively. Uh, around 10% of Indian population would have some form of chronic kidney disease, some That's stages of chronic kidney That's disease. That's a lot. We are talking about huge numbers. Yes. So the studies which actually show would around a percent to 13%, but that would depend what stage of chronic kidney disease yes. they are looking at. But... Interestingly, in 2017, the International Society of Nephrology had some task force in place and they put the number to around 17%. Yes, I've seen that paper. So, mm. uh, we are talking yes, about yes, humongous yes, numbers, yes, huge yes. numbers we are talking yes. about. Once we talk about chronic kidney disease, it is important to realize we are not only talking about the health of the kidney. We are also talking about the health of the heart, the health of the brain. The early stages of chronic kidney disease are not the ones who are likely to progress to dialysis or transplant. A good majority of them would die because of a heart ailment, because of a stroke. So once we talk about health of the kidneys, we have to realize that it's closely linked with the overall survival, not because of the kidney health, but because of the heart and the brain as well. So even early stages of chronic kidney disease, at times people say, oh, it's a huge number. But you see, the burden of kidney disease is less. What they are talking about is dialysis and transplant. Right. So only a small proportion actually would progress to dialysis and transplant. But around more than majority of them won't reach that stage because they already would have died because of either a heart ailment or a brain stroke. So those are really important points. And sometimes we just look at the creatinine and we look at markers of kidney dysfunction and feel reassured that our kidney is okay, which is good. But the truth is, even if you have a protein leak from the kidney, Absolutely. even that correlates with a higher prevalence of or higher incidence of heart attacks and strokes. And many patients with chronic kidney disease don't reach the terminal stage of kidney disease, but they succumb to these other complications in yeah. between. So, so that's it's all linked. It's, it's all, linked. all linked. So that's what is important to realize. And that's somehow lost in translation. At times people say, oh, creatinine of 1.5, you are saying chronic kidney stage 3. But it's hardly of any relevance. Uh, not realizing that it's a very important marker for an increased risk for cardiovascular complications. I think uh, we've got some really important points out of you. Uh, uh, how do we correlate risk factors in India? In, in our younger days, if I may say, it was thought that you know the risk factors in India are mainly infection. We were told it's all chronic infection of the kidney, which we call pyelonephritis. Uh, but we know that the NCD scene in India has completely changed. NCD meaning non-communicable diseases, non-infectious disease. And with an in increase, exponential increase in non-infectious diseases in India, uh, how have the risk factors changed in India, Dr. Khair? Yeah, see, uh, unfortunately in India, we still continue to have infectious diseases continuing, uh, although the rest of the world has already taken care of them. But non-communicable diseases are up on the rise and so we are uh, straddled with actually both components of the disease factors. The infectious disease still contribute to morbidity and mortality and the non-communicable diseases as we are talking about you can see that is achieving an epidemic 
proportions of heart disease, kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension, all these are important. So, so I think what is happening in India is that you have already probably talked in your program that diabetes occurs earlier in India. Yes, early age. Absolutely. So the kidney disease also occurs earlier. In, in average, a Western world, diabetes causes kidney disease at the age of 50 and 60s. In our country, it causes diabetic kidney disease at the age of 40, 40, 45. That's, that's again. So it affects younger population uh, in our country. And therefore, progression is much rapid. They reach end-stage kidney disease, which Foster. we call the, the need for dialysis or tra transplantation, which is stage 5 kidney disease. That would also occur at a very younger age, and that affects the economic strength of the country and affects yeah. not only... So the working class, people the who family, are really in the family, family yeah. the earning members of the family, getting affected. So that's, that's the crux of the problem in this country, and therefore... It's, in my opinion, extremely important mm. that mm. we should try mm. to control. Fortunately, diabetes and hypertension don't cause kidney disease in, in a ziffy. It takes some time for years, many years, usually 10 to 15 years for uncontrolled diabetes and uncontrolled diabetes. So there is a huge potential, which you were talking about, that there is a huge potential for us to prevent. Intervene, intervene, they intervene. Ca cause about kidney disease in about 70% of the people, diabetes and hypertension. 70% of the kidney disease. So if we take care of them, then we should be able to make a huge dent, if not in totally preventing development of kidney disease, but at least delaying the need for dialysis and transplantation, which are more expensive and more difficult treatments to it. So I think that's, that's probably so, very so important. So the important message that is being communicated is the fact that many of the risk factors for chronic kidney disease are in our control. They are modifiable. So, you know, treating these conditions like diabetes and high blood pressure is like buying an insurance policy. If you treat them well at that stage, you will avoid catastrophe later. And unfortunately, because they don't produce symptoms, sometimes we tend to ignore them. So the message is very clear for the kidney, for the heart, for the liver. You really have to make sure that these chronic disorders are addressed from day one. And it's not so hard. It can be done. We just have to set our mind to it. We'll be back with you after a short break. Welcome back after the break, and I move to Dr. Kuller. You know, we've been talking about kidney disease, kidney disease, acute, chronic. How will I know that I have got chronic kidney disease? What is the way? What are the signs and symptoms? How do we diagnose? And then I'll come to you, Dr. Mahajan, that in vast uh, population uh, segments, we may not have access to all those tests all the time. So what are we generally, as a simplified protocol, what are we following? And Dr. Kuller, you first. Yeah. So let me limit myself to something uh, which is more relevant and important from a, a common uh, person point of view, and that's chronic kidney disease. We are talking about chronic kidney disease as something which is uh, a, like a slow poison. Uh, a diabetes is not going to affect the kidneys of a given person overnight. It will take uh, some time, maybe many years. So you have to be alert to the possibility and pick up those people who are more predisposed to get chronic kidney disease. So to give an example, uh, if you are not uh, cautious enough, you will be missing most of the patients of chronic kidney disease in their early stages. And that's the crux. 
by the time they reach a kidney specialist, yeah, I think it's too late. Too late. And the disease but it still happens. All, it happens it, all it the happens time. Quite even, even in relatively affluent environments, it still happens true. that people straight away reach the kidney specialist. Quite true. And you will be amazed that the number of patients, even in the affluent society, who uh, are diagnosed to have a kidney disease related to diabetes, are the ones where both get picked up simultaneously. On one hand, we are saying diabetes takes a number of years to cause kidney disease. And here we are talking about people where both their diabetes and kidney disease got diagnosed simultaneously, which obviously means we have missed the bus at the right time. Now, if you were to wait for the signs and symptoms of chronic kidney disease, maybe you are going to be too late. So I will, I will uh, dissect your question into two. Number one, what are the signs and the symptoms? And number two, uh, how do you diagnose them? So for the signs and symptoms, it's very important to recapitulate as to what the kidneys are supposed to do in our body. So they, as you had rightly pointed out earlier, they are not just involved with the uh, purification of the blood. They have many tasks in addition to uh, getting rid of the impurities of the blood. And that means they get rid of impurities like urea, creatinine, many other toxins you may not even have heard of. I'm talking from a common person's point of view. The second uh, equally uh, important uh, is that the, the signs and symptoms appear quite late. So you have to have a high index of suspicion in these patients. Now let's pick them one by one. If the impurities were to get accumulated in the body, the patients will get symptoms related to that. These symptoms could be nausea, vomiting, uh, even a very nagging symptom of itching, which, which happens in our patients. Um, the other very common uh, uh, function of the kidneys is they are the seat of production of hemoglobin. The process of hemoglobin production starts Control at the level the of the kidney. kidneys. And if the hemoglobin goes low, uh, obviously you can expect the, the work capacity of a given individual is going to suffer. They may become more and more symptomatic. They may not want to work at all. The athletes may become uh, uh, probably a, a sedentary, um, um, have more and more kind of uh, um, uh, lack of, uh, of uh, uh, interest in the normal activities. Now, if anemia, that is low hemoglobin, progresses any further, it is going to have uh, adverse effects on the heart as well. Patient may start becoming breathless. And also at the same time, when the kidneys are not able to get rid of the acid from the body, there is accumulation of acid in the blood, and that can give rise to uh, breathlessness. So these are the symptoms which are early and so many times ignored. And as the kidney disease progresses, the symptoms become more and more prominent. They start having vomitings. The itching becomes more profound. They, as I already said, do not want to uh, work. Uh, their work capacity uh, gets impaired. And now the more advanced stages, you will have a more and more crippling disease, will not allow them to walk for uh, um, uh, um, more time. And ultimately, patients become more and more drowsy. They can finally have quite a serious, serious complication problem. related to more Very advanced weak and almost bedridden because all the muscle mass goes away, right? right? They, they lose a lot of their muscle mass. Yeah. So to try and figure out as to where do our patients uh, uh, fit in, we have something called stages of chronic kidney disease. Starting from very early stages, CKD, chronic kidney disease stage one, to the, the more advanced uh, three, four, and five. And stage five is the one where you start preparing your patients or actually starting them on renal replacement, replacement therapy, therapy in the form of either dialysis or transplantation. But the most important stages in our context are the early stages, stages one and two, whereby it becomes extremely difficult to pick up kidney disease unless you really go out of your way to pick up those patients and, and use the word catch them young, you will be missing the bus. Stage one where there is hardly anything wrong, apparently. Yet, if you probe further, you will find that your patient has some kind of predisposition to kidney disease. And as the stages progress, typically, stage kidney. three onwards, patients land up with the, the nephrologist, nephrologist. And then it's probably too late. And I think yeah. the, the preventive part has already been missed. 
and now it's going to be a relentless course of the disease. So, so uh, very neatly outlined, uh, you know, the stages of kidney disease and again and again, the point that is emerging is we have to act early. Most of this is preventable. This whole burden of kidney disease on society, on family, can, on the individual, of course, can be prevented to a large extent by our efforts. Uh, uh, Dr. Majan, how do we, what tests do we do? Which are the key tests, that is a basic test that we do to decide if someone has a kidney problem or not? Well, fortunately, you don't require a very expensive or a very difficult test to know about the health of the kidney. You just require a simple urine examination to look for albumin. If you are secreting albumin in the urine, which is not normally seen, that means there is something wrong with the kidney. And again, loss of albumin is not only a marker of kidney disease, it's a marker of so many more things. It tells you about your poor health in the heart of the vessels as well. The second thing is blood renal function test, as we call them. That is a simple blood urea, creatinine and electrolytes. Though they come late, as Dr. Khula pointed out, it usually comes once around... 60%, 40% of the kidney is already damaged. So it comes a bit late, but still they are the best test as far as the screening the general population is concerned. And third probably is an ultrasound, which can tell you whether you have two healthy, normal looking kidneys or not. You would be surprised that a good percentage are born with a single kidney. There can be certain problems with the structure of the kidney, which can be picked on the ultrasound. So a screening ultrasound maybe if we have that facility. So these three simple tests, to a great extent, accessible, are accessible to the majority of population, and they can tell you a lot about your kidney health. So, Dr. Mahajan, patients often come and ask, what is this GFR, EGFR? All my doctors now talk about EGFR. Can you explain what is EGFR? Well, EGFR is just a mathematical extrapolation of the serum creatinine value. So if you have a serum creatinine value, you just by a mathematical model would predict that this is the amount of function which the kidney is doing. So GFR stands for glomerular filtration, filtration rate, which is basically the excretory function of the kidney. So a GFR roughly would tell you that this is the percentage or this is the amount of uh, functioning of the kidney as far as the excretory function is concerned. As I said, from the creatinine-based equations, you can still tend to miss the early stages of chronic kidney diseases and this is where the importance of urine examination comes in. So many times, we have people who would have volumes of blood reports with them. They are diabetics, they would have HbA1c's, they would have lipids, they would have every damn thing. They would have a single so urine, urine report, which is so easy to do and so easy to interpret. So if you have to catch kidney diseases early, it has to be a combination of urine as well as blood investigations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahajan. I'll come back to you, Dr. Kher. So... It's already been touched upon, but I want you to enumerate, uh, you know, what are the consequences of chronic kidney disease? We already touched upon the fact that heart disease increases and stroke increases. And, you know, so if, if I get chronic kidney disease today, what am I looking at, you know, different parts of my body? You, as well as Dr. Mahajan, highlighted it again that kidney disease is a cause not only of consequences of the kidney failure itself, but of the vascular health, the health of the heart, the health of the, the blood vessels. So it's a, it's a continuum of, if we are talking of diabetes, hypertension, you're seeing that it's a continuum of the endothelial damage and progressive vascular damage. So it's an it's a important cause of death. So And Dr. Mahajan highlighted that you may not develop advanced kidney disease, but you may die of heart attack or a heart failure much before you develop kidney failure. So this is an important thing that kidney disease is a forerunner of increased death. And it's not only the increase in the serum creatinine, but albumin in the urine. And that's why it's important not only to look for albumin in the urine, but also to quantify that albumin in the urine. And with effective treatments, if you can bring down the quantity of albumin in the urine or decrease the creatinine or stabilize the creatinine, you might be able to stabilize this kidney disease. So the other consequences of kidney disease, as was highlighted by the symptoms which Dr. Kula talked about, is that patients develop severe bone disease because kidneys synthesize vitamin D, active vitamin D, and you also mentioned that the bone and the calcium health of the body is maintained. So people can develop 
severe bone disease. So when a patient comes with diabetes and bone disease and has also anemia, think of kidney disease as a cause for this combined kind of a syndrome. So heart disease we talked about, uncontrolled blood pressure can be a consequence of kidney disease, yeah. blood pressure as can a be a cause of kidney disease. So kidney disease aggravates blood pressure and causes progressive damage to kidney as well as progressive damage overall to improve, increase heart attacks as well as strokes. Uh, so that's, that's what can happen. Anemia is already being talked about. Kidney is this organ which manufactures erythropoietin which makes the hemoglobin in the body. So therefore, almost invariably, all patients will have. And then as progressive kidney failure occurs, people can become unconscious, they can develop uh, arrhythmias in their heart, and they can develop hemorrhages as such uh, everywhere in the heart. So they can... They can you want to talk about the eye a little bit? The, the, because, uh, the eyes, eye eyes, also, are, huh. eyes are important, especially since diabetes is yes. the commonest cause. Yeah. And diabetes is a common cause of loss of vision. And it's very common when diabetes affects kidneys, in majority of the patients, eyes go hand in hand with them. So looking into the eyes is easier. I can't look into the kidneys but I can look into the eyes. And looking into the eyes tells you the story about what's happening in the kidney as well. So both these organs uh, go hand in hand, although in about 30% of patients, they may go separately also. Yeah. So, so one has to keep in mind that you may still have diabetic kidney disease, but may have no eye disease, or you may have eye disease, but, but may not, not have a kidney, kidney disease. disease. But that happens. So loss of vision would be another, another important a consequence of uh, a combined process of diabetes. Hypertension is another cause of loss of vision as well, can cause hemorrhages and all that. So these are interlinked yes. kind of diseases, so affecting so, multiple so, organs. Yeah, uh, but yeah. kidney disease aggravates all these consequences of the diabetes and hypertension. So, so I think uh, it's important for you to remember, why do we advise people with diabetes to go for an eye check at least once a year? And one of the reasons, of course, is to look at the eye. Uh, but also, often the eye reflects what's happening in your kidney. So don't ignore your eye check if you have diabetes or even blood pressure. It's good to get your eye retina examined, not an optometrist test alone. Get your retina examined at least once a year by a qualified professional. We'll take another short break and be back with you soon. संसदीय समितियां भारतीय लोकतंत्र का आधार पक्ष विपक्ष सभी हैं इसके हिस्सेदार सरकार को बनाती जवाबदेह पार्लियामेंट एक्टवर्क Welcome back as we continue our discussion on kidney and its disorders and how to keep our kidneys safe. Uh, you know, we already discussed the fact that to prevent progression or onset of chronic kidney disease, we need to control the modifiable risk factors. And the most common ones are diabetes, blood pressure, uh, you know, obesity per se is also a risk factor and obviously giving up smoking or tobacco. But there's a lot of discussion about diets and diets in sort of two uh, silos one is uh, yeah yes intervene one yes. point on the prevention while we are yes. before you yes. go yes. to yes. diet and that's basically that who are the people at high risk for development yes. of kidney disease yes. and diabetes those diabetics who already have a family history yes. of Very kidney disease and the diabetes and i thought that that was a point which yes. needs to be highlighted that Patient who has a family history of diabetic kidney disease already, and if there are other members of patients yes. who are now getting diabetes, they at a very young yes. age should be We've looking. And what should they do? I think they should do hemoglobin A1C every three months. They should look for albumin mm. in the urine every three to six months, I think. Uh, that would be, I think, this high-risk 
kind of family would be something that I would suggest would be the best thing yes, to do. Absolutely. They should look at least once a year for the eye. Whether your doctor prescribes it or not, do it on your own. Absolutely. Remind your doctor about it. I feel that was the point which I thought I think would it's, be important. it's a very important stratification of risk. And in the stratification, family history, like we discussed in so many conditions in earlier programs, is very important. There is clustering of kidney disease in people with diabetes in some families. And those need to be extra vigilant if your parents or somebody in the family had diabetes and chronic kidney disease, had blood pressure and chronic kidney disease. Those people are at higher risk and you should be extra vigilant with your testing and with your consultations with your doctor. Uh, yes, so... So we come back to you, Dr. Mahajan, about the diet. And there are two sort of groups. One is what kind of diet is in general good for the kidney, what is okay. And I will particularly ask you about salt there. Okay. okay. And then if someone develops chronic kidney disease, how do you tackle the diet there? Okay. So as you very rightly pointed out, that a diet forms a very important component both for the risk for kidney disease as well as for the therapy of kidney disease. So... Uh, generally, you should have a good healthy diet with healthy lifestyle. So by healthy diet, we mean a salt-restricted diet, not more than 5 to 6 grams a day of salt. We are talking about adequate fruit and vegetable intake. We are talking about moderation about animal proteins. So this would be a usual healthy diet. Another very pertinent question which people keep on asking us is how much water to drink. Yes, you so, can flush out everything, drink lots of so, water. Yeah. Yes. So my take on that is you should drink as thirsty as you are. A very important point. So mm. unless your doctor says so, you have certain diseases in which you require more of water. That would be those who have stone disease, those who have, say, a congenital or hereditary problem of polycystic kidney disease. So these would be a very small set of patients who would require higher fluid intake. The general misconception is that I get up in the morning, I drink two liters of water, my kidneys are flushed and I am healthy. That's wrong. You are producing unnecessary burden on the kidneys to excrete that water. So you just, as you eat as hungry you are, you should drink as thirsty as you are. Thirst is a bigger reflex, a bigger reflex than hunger. You can die hungry, but you can't even uh, remain thirsty for yes. a very small period yeah. of time. Yes. So... You just follow your instincts and drink as much as you want. But we, we are careful about hunger. We don't say, <laughs> endocrinologists don't say, eat as hungry as you are, because then we'll end up with a lot of issues. Lot of please issues. go ahead, sir. Yeah. Please go ahead. So this is one thing about diet. So a salt-restricted diet, adequate amount of fruits and vegetables, a restriction in uh, animal proteins and fats. So this would be a healthy, wholesome uh, diet, which we should be usually having as a person to prevent kidney diseases. Once you have chronic kidney disease, then the situation changes a bit. The salt restriction becomes even more restrictive because kidneys are the organs which would be excreting the salt. So you would have to decrease the salt intake even further, even up to three grams, so which would be half of what a normal population would have. There's some role in patients who have predominantly a non-vegetarian diet of some restriction of protein intake, especially the animal component of that. Normal Indian vegetarian diet or normal Indian miscellaneous diet, we don't advise protein restriction because as such, we are not touching the mark of one gram per kg, yes. which is the routine prescription. We already are under, uh, we are a population which takes lesser amount of protein. So I don't think so. We routinely prescribe protein restriction, we only change the pattern of protein they take. From low biological value, we shift them to high, high biological value, value proteins. So that's the only change in protein. But somehow, people tend to associate kidney disease with severe protein restriction. What happens is they would have some decrease in urea, which would happen because protein is the source of urea production, yes. which necessarily does not mean the kidney is working well, which means that you are losing your muscle mass, you are getting malnourished, and by the, by the time you require dialysis, you are the ones who are doing the worst because you already are malnourished. So the level of nutrition you have at the start of dialysis determines the outcome okay. of dialysis Fantastic. rather than the amount of creatinine you have at the time of dialysis. So this is a misconception which I want to really emphasize here that please don't get malnourished. Please don't restrict your protein altogether. 
you just require some tailoring of your protein intake, shift to more high biological value protein intake rather than low biological value protein intake. So this is a very important message and Dr. Kher and I and Dr. Kular, we've been talking about this all the time, uh, that, that Indian diets by and large, except a few, a uh, small segment of the population, actually don't have enough protein. And the Western concept, that stamp of restrict protein and nutritionists sometimes follow it and advise you. And we get so many patients coming to the OPD with diabetes and chronic kidney disease who first thing they do is give up protein. protein. So you need protein for anabolizing, an anabolism. You need protein for, for, for building your muscle. You need that. So you cannot restrict protein unless you are at that zone. So you in that zone. So you need to talk to your doctor to decide what kind of protein restriction is required, if at all uh, any. And I think that's a really important point. But more about salt. Okay, so the salt story is the one which is really very contentious and gets murkier each day. We as Indians tend to have a lot of salt in our diet. Lot of achar chutney papers, lot of uh, table salt being used left, right and center with us, uh, even in our houses. And that's where the problem is. So we. Uh, the moment we say salt restriction, the people tend to have bland food, but would be using a lot of preserved salt. They would be using a lot of chutneys. They would be using a lot of pickles, a <laughs> lot of achars. So not realizing that the whole allowance of the salt of three grams or four grams is taken in one small yeah, salt, yeah. Uh, one small pickle or chutney, yeah, one yeah. teaspoon of chutney. So uh, that's where the salt story starts. The other uh, recent fad or recent fashion has been using the salt supplements. Uh, these salt supplements are basically replacing sodium with potassium. So they conventionally are low sodium salts. They taste a bit like normal salt, but they are high in potassium. This might be okay for a general population. For a general intervention, it's fine. You restrict your sodium, you increase your potassium intake. It's good for your blood pressure, it's good for your heart, as these advertisements would show. But once you have a kidney disease, kidney is the main organ which excretes potassium. So the moment you start taking these salt supplements, your kidney would tend, it won't be able to excrete that much of potassium and you would have higher serum potassium levels. And that can become very disastrous for your heart. It can lead on to certain uh, heart rhythm abnormalities which can become life-threatening. So once you have chronic kidney disease, please, 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 don't take salt supplements. No sandha namak, no rock salt, no other salt supplements. So, Just plain and simple sodium chloride or plain and simple salt, which you use at home. And that also with restriction, not more than three grams a day. So I think those are, again, very important myths that are busted uh, by our experts today. Uh, and I would add another aspect to this. And when we move to non-normal, non-common salt, one of the problems we face is that the iodine that has been added with so much effort and has led to eradication of IDD in our country, some of the, our more sort of aware and more internet educated and, and, and uh, patients have stopped taking that. And we've had patients develop thyroid problems quite simply because there was no iodine. So you're going back to the 80s where low iodine was a problem uh, when it is totally been eradicated by addition of iodine to the mm -hmm. salt. So just to put that in perspective, uh, one line answer from you, Dr. Kher, about is chronic kidney disease ever reversible? Because the patient's expression changes moment they, they are told they have a kidney involvement. Is it reversible to some extent or is it like a, like a path that one has to follow? Usually if uh, kidney dysfunction occurs in these causes that we talked about, diabetes, hypertension, unless there has been an acute factor of an obstruction or an acute deterioration in kidney function because of accelerated blood pressure or sudden uh, deterioration in diabetes leading to volume depletion, ketoacidosis and something like that, <laughs> and the kidney dysfunction which occurs might reverse, might reverse. So one will always have to look for, and I think it's important for physicians. So patients should not necessarily make their own impressions about this. They should go to their doctors to decide whether there is. And every physician is taught actually that they must look for reversibility of kidney function. Even when you decide that the patient has reached advanced kidney failure, it is extremely important to look for if there are 
reversible factors. Any volume depletion, any drugs that the patient may have taken, interstitial mm -hmm. drugs. A lot of drug people take uh, non-traditional kind of medicines. Yes. The traditional medicines which are there, uh, Ayurvedic and homeopathy, considered to be safe, but many of them may be damaged to the kidneys because all these drugs are excreted through the kidneys and therefore it's an organ which gets affected by many of these drugs, which may be safe for other organs, but the kidney suffers the most when you take these drugs, which are not necessarily many times, people believe that they are safe yeah, for the, we don't for the kidneys. And they're we not don't all know. the same. We, they're we not all the same. Yeah, we Just, don't know. We, yeah, don't know. we don't know. And many times there may be an acute deterioration yes. related to this. Yes. This might reverse, but by and large, otherwise, if there is an irreversible damage to the kidney, it will progress. But it takes many years for it to progress to an advanced kidney disease. And we can slow so the progression. I think we can slow the progression. Fortunately, there are many newer drugs which yes. have started yes. coming, yes. which have started showing that we may be able to reverse also from yeah. causing macroalbuminuria, micro. proteinuria, over proteinuria to microalbuminuria and microalbuminuria to albuminuria. So it is potentially possible to, if not reverse, but at least stabilize the kidney function for many, many years. Although it's a progressive disease, but some kidney diseases may be less progressive, especially those which do not have too much of albumin in the urine, non-albumin urine kidney diseases. So there slower. may be a slower kind of thing, but blood pressure control and diabetes control and the, drugs yeah. and uh, the diet that we are talking about. These are the pyramids on which you can sort of travel and you can, you can sort of keep these diseases at, at a good control. So, I so, think that's so the very important point that Dr. Kher is making, as well as other experts, is the role of uh, over-the-counter painkillers. It's very important. Uh, almost all painkillers, with little exception, will have potentially some impact on the kidney. So don't abuse painkillers. They are very important drugs to relieve us of pain. I mean, that's the whole purpose of life. But the fact is that you have to use them in controlled amounts under supervision. Just popping painkillers, and we have patients who haven't asked a doctor and are continuing to pop painkillers for years together is really dangerous for your, for your kidney. And also remember that when you use alternative medicines, please check with your doctor. Some of them may contain uh, molecules or, or substances that will not be good for your kidney. Others may be fine, but don't blindly accept their safety without checking with your doctor. The uh, other drug which I think is important but not as much emphasized is the, is the gas medicine, the pantoprazole yeah, yeah, and Pantoprazol. the other things, yeah, and yeah, pantoprazole yeah. and these yes. gas medicines. They, and we continue to take them yes. for long periods long of time. Uh, long term usage of these drugs is Can not also. good. So one must be always cautious before you start taking these drugs on a long term basis. And I think any drug, pantoprazole is an extremely good drug otherwise for acid peptic disease, yes. but used for a short period of time, they will reverse most of the symptoms. But if continued for long periods of time, they can be dangerous. So I come to you, Dr. Kular. You know, we've tried everything, and still so many of our patients reach uh, uh, the stage of dialysis. So what is this dialysis? Patient says, the rest of the dialysis is not good. If it's dialysis is not good. What is dialysis? What is Unfortunately, but... Uh, uh, condemned word ban gaya hai, something which should be uh, really um, uh, taken as a big hope to the patients who suffer uh, from advanced stages of chronic kidney disease uh, over the years has always been touted as a villain. And I'll come back to that. So before talking about dialysis, so let's make sure that we have really tried our level best to prevent our patients from reaching the so-called CKD stage 5 or the most advanced stage of chronic kidney disease. And again, we must re-emphasize the importance of prevention. Prevention of diabetes, then prevention of diabetes kidney affecting kidney. the kidneys, and then what Professor Kher was talking about, if you uh, unfortunately already have repercussions of uh, diabetes and have some kind of chronic kidney disease. On one hand, we have good weapons nowadays in our armamentarium which can slow down the rate of progression of chronic kidney disease and also be mindful of our responsibility uh, of slowing down 
via avoiding mistakes that if you have been a smoker, now is the best time to quit it. If you uh, have been taking painkillers, now is the time to say goodbye to the injudicious use of yeah, any, yeah. any medicine which can have some kind of effect on the kidneys. Now, having said that, you have tried your level best. Unfortunately, uh, God forbid, your patient still has reached a stage of chronic kidney disease. Let's not try to project dialysis as a villain. Dialysis has been a savior for millions of people. I, for one, chose the speciality of nephrology just because I could see the magic it could have in a given patient's life. A patient panting for breath, almost unconscious, and almost declared by the, the, uh, everyone around that he's going to die very soon, suddenly with the help of dialysis, bounces back. And it is not just about saving someone's life. It is nowadays we can proudly say that even in our country, we can offer state-of-the-art dialysis, which can allow our people with uh, end-stage kidney disease to live for not just one, two, or five years, but periods as long as more than 20 years, even in our country. We used to hear that people in Japan or yes. other affluent countries yes. were living for yes. 40 years, yes. 50 years yes. on dialysis. Yes. I think the time is not very far when we'll be, say, we'll be able to say that same thing happens to our uh, patients as well. Look at when we say that, oh, kidneys are bad, now it's dialysis, it's a death warrant. Hai. I often say that probably kidneys are the only organs where we have found a solution, yes. that we have found a solution whereby one can live for decades on dialysis. Now, coming back to your question, what is dialysis? It's a magic. In simple words, it is nothing but magic. We, we could translate into whatever we learned from our physics uh, principles and, and extrapolate it into um, um, dialysis, which has become a savior. Mm. Now, what happens is um, the blood now, you can imagine, is full of impurities. Now, with the help of dialysis, and there are two forms of dialysis. One is called hemodialysis, which is quite widely uh, known to uh, most of us, whereby we draw blood out of a given patient's body, make it pass through a machine called dialysis machine, and at the level of the dialysis machine, there's a dialyzer or an artificial kidney. At this stage, Blood is made to run in a particular direction, and a special fluid called dialysate is made to run in the opposite direction. And the two are separated by something called a semi-permeable membrane. Now, if one is to be reminded of the physics principles I was uh, talking about, it's a simple diffusion principle. Whatever is more in the blood, that means the impurities, which are not there in the special fluid called dialysate, will move from the blood, higher concentration, to dialysate and down the drain. And the good things can actually be made to pass from the other side into the blood. So that is a hemodialysis. That's that a hemodialysis. Is done to two or three times a week, typically three times a week yes. in patients with chronic kidney so disease. So people say that, oh, now we are badly stuck. Ab hume to aur kuch nahi gaya, dialysis. I often tell them, even four hours of dialysis, three times in a week is 12, 12 hours. hours. You have 168 hours in a week you are giving to your disease only 12 hours. The remaining 156 are uh, yours, and you can lead a perfectly good life very, very if, important. God forbid, you had very reached important. a stage of dialysis. Now, the other form of dialysis is, which can be conveniently done from the confines of your own home. This is called peritoneal dialysis, whereby now we are putting in, uh, inserting a catheter in the peritoneal cavity Again, a special dialysate fluid is instilled into the peritoneal cavity. The same principles will now hold true, whereby the peritoneum membrane. becomes that semi-permeable okay. membrane. On one hand, you have blood flowing into the peritoneum, separated from the, that special fluid, which you instill into the peritoneal cavity. The two cannot come in contact with each other. But again, with the same physics principle, the impurities from the blood will now move on into that special fluid. And after about six hours, four to six hours, you remove that fluid. It takes just about 20, 25 minutes. Done three times in a day, or maybe a maximum four times in a day, will allow you to lead a perfectly normal life. You can travel. You can work with the same work capacity as you were doing earlier. So my, again, uh, humble request to everyone, 
we have a magic in the form of dialysis, <laughs> which, yes, that stage should be prevented. But God forbid, if someone starts requiring dialysis, let's not, as I used the word earlier, make a villain out of it. Fantastic explanation of dialysis. We have one comment from Dr. Mahajan about uh, dialysis access in our population and the challenges that we are facing. On the one hand, our dialysis systems have improved so much when they reach premier institutions like yours, quality of life and everything is very good. But the requirement, the need for dialysis is huge and a lot of effort has been made. So you want to make a one-line comment on that and then last word from Dr. Kheron Transplant. We are running hopelessly out of time. <laughs> Well, the dialysis was started in India in early 1960s. So it's not a new form of therapy for us. We have been doing it for quite some time. Uh, for past three or four years, the central government has actually actively taken interest yes. in the dialysis program. And both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis are now into the national uh, prime minister health program. All the district hospitals now have a dialysis facility, which fortunately are running quite well. But still, we are still sh hopelessly understaffed as far as the nephrologists are concerned and as far as our capability to reach our vast population is concerned. And maybe, maybe that's where peritoneal dialysis can actually chip in. And in the, because we have an enormous country, we have a huge country, providing dialysis only at district headquarters might not be the solution. We have huge rural population which has to be reached. So that's maybe where peritoneal dialysis, which as Dr. Kula very rightfully explained, can be done at home, can be done. Currently, only around 10% of our patients who require dialysis actually get dialysis. 80 to 90% don't get it. So, But there, still, are, there are green shoots. I mean, there is a lot of movement yeah, in that direction. For past four or five years, there have yes. been huge steps forward as far as providing dialysis to our general population. We need to keep moving, keep pushing. Keep pushing. Uh, yeah, Dr. Sure. Kher, we are out of time, but how can you have a discussion on chronic kidney disease without yeah. uh, talking about transplant? So we need just a one-minute line yeah, on kidney transplant. transplantation is the best treatment for kidney failure. There's no doubt about that, both from uh, purpose of quality of life, quantity of life, and, and the cost of treatment. Uh, because... The first year cost of transplantation may be high, but the continuing cost of immunosuppressive drugs is much, much less in, in transplantation than in dialysis. Transplantation also provides much longer uh, quantity of life in comparison to dialysis. There's no doubt about that. The only question is shortage of organs, availability of donors. And in our country, majority of the transplants are occurring are living donor transplantations. We do not have a disease donor program from the people who come with accidents or uh, brain dead people from stroke. Uh, people also are not uh, donating organs as much from these uh, brain dead people. So I think I would also appeal to the people that we should donate organs at the time of uh, possible brain death whenever it is possible. We should donate organs so that disease donation becomes a possibility in our country in a greater extent. It is happening, it's getting better and better, but it's still, uh, for kidney transplantation, still about 90% of the transplants are living donor transplantation, which means that people will have to have their relatives to come forward to donate kidneys, and that becomes a limitation. Fortunately, these days, otherwise, a blood group compatibility was considered to be an no, important okay. step, essential important step for organ donation. But that is also changing now, ABO incompatible transplants, paired kidney donations, and all other uh, methods by which we can limit the shortage of organ donors is being taken care of. But I think the most important element which will be essential for us is to increase the disease organ donation in our country. And, and I think that's very important. Yeah. It also allows other organs to be transplanted, yes, for which so, there are no maintenance yeah, yeah, therapies yeah, like yeah, dialysis, yeah. like heart transplants yeah, yeah. and liver transplants. Yes. So these are organs for Absolutely. which uh, there isn't any maintenance therapy. So you require organs all the time uh, in these kind of situations. So, so I think that's very, very important. So I think that that's a very important message. And fortunately, that's also one of the thrust areas of a of government, uh, the awareness about organ donation uh, and, you know, the health ministry and everyone's now really pitching in to spread awareness about organ donation. And I think we'll have to end this wonderful discussion here. Uh, we, we spoke about what is the kidney. We spoke about acute versus chronic kidney disease. 
and then we focused largely on prevention and management of chronic kidney disease. We spoke about the risk factors that are important to be corrected, the modifiable risk factors, and again, I'll repeat, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, avoidance of drugs that produce uh, you know, kidney damage, and the whole gamut, as has been discussed. We also spoke about hope for those who do get affected. So it's not that everything is prevention is very important, yes, but everything is not just prevention because it, it means that if you get disease, you will feel despondent and you will feel you know, disheartened that, you know, my God, despite all that, I could not uh, prevent my kidneys from getting affected. And that happens to the best of us sometimes. For that, there is amazing treatment now available at all our kidney centers, uh, both in terms of uh, medical treatment to prevent progression of disease, in terms of dialysis to provide a high quality of life. Uh, and I have personal examples in the family where people have lived for 10 years with, with good dialysis facilities without any problem, even in their 80s, even in their 80s. Uh, and of course, the, the, the issue of renal transplant. So please take care of your kidneys, take care of your lifestyle, listen to your doctor, and we'll be back with more next week. Thank you.